the metaphysical hour. And we're going to have another wonderful guest tonight and a lot of things to talk about. Before we begin, I want to give out the toll-free number if anyone wants to call in. The number is 877-876-5227, and that number is toll-free anywhere in the world. So anyone that is listening in anywhere on the planet will be able to call in if they want to. As a rule, not very many call in. I guess they get too busy listening anyway. (laughs) Before we talk with our guest, I do want to talk a little bit about the conference that's coming up. My company is Ozark Mountain Publishing, and we're putting on our first conference. We're calling it the Transformation Conference. And it's going to be in Fayetteville, Arkansas, at the Clarion Inn on June the 3rd and the 4th. And um, this is our very first one that we have done, and we're very excited about it because we are promoting most of our authors at this conference. The keynote speaker at the conference is going to be the grandson of Mahatma Gandhi, Arun Gandhi. And he will be the one I will be interviewing next week. So there's going to be some good speakers. I do want to mention another man who is coming out of retirement. This is a rare appearance. Uh, This is Aaron Abramson. Now, back in the 70s, Aaron Abramson was very famous psychic. He doesn't like to be called a psychic, but he was a forerunner before John Edwards and James Brown Frog, he was doing the psychic readings, and he called them the Akashic Record Life Readings. He did thousands and thousands of these all over the world, and he was a very famous man. And then he went into retirement. We published his book, but he has not done any public speaking in many years. But I'm sure there's many of his loyal followers out there because we get mail saying, what is he doing? Does he still do any readings? Now, he'll be there on a very rare appearance, so this is a good time to be able to come and hear Aaron Abramson. All right. My guest tonight is Christine Ramos. She's our newest author that our company is publishing. (laughs) She's so new that her book is just now coming off the press. We wanted her to be a speaker at the conference, but the problem was how do we get her book out in time because I want to have it there so that she can sign it. But whenever you're working under a deadline, it really gets hectic, and that's what we've been doing, very close deadline to get that book to the printers, and it's supposed to be off the press next week. So we're cutting it very close to have her book at the conference. But Christine Mm -hmm. is a very unique person, and I'm going to let her talk here now. Okay, Christine, I want you to tell them about yourself, your background. Well, um, I am a registered nurse. I am a certified childbirth educator, um, a certified doula, and a certified breastfeeding counselor. Prior to um, becoming a nurse, I worked in uh, the social service field for nine years as a counselor um, and then later as an administrator, and uh, that was for the population of the mentally ill and substance abusers. Mm, So you've had a wide range of experience, haven't you? Yeah, yes, I have. But I think it gave me the unique perspective of seeing health and wellness um, through for the physical and the mental you know, as well as my own personal background in spirituality. Mm-hmm. So it gave me that benefit of seeing the, all of those perspectives, and I think that's what really um, helped to create this book. Yes, Christine's book is called A Journey into Being, and it's from a different perspective because she's uh, writing about uh, babies because she is, has been an obstetric nurse for many years, but she's coming at it from a different angle. She's writing about the babies as spirit and getting people to see them in that way. Isn't that true? Yes, absolutely. And I think it's 
it's long been time that uh, we look at our children as spirit um, because they have very distinct needs when they're first born. Um, when you think about it, you have the uh, vulnerability of their body and their fragility of mind, and then you combine that with an eternal or a timeless uh, soul, and um, you come up with a person with very distinct or a little person with very distinct needs. And and, I, you know, according to the traditional way of looking absolutely. at it, you know, it's just a baby being born that has no, uh, but nothing there. They just feel, I guess, that you have to form it out of nothing. Right. And that it's, you know, it's very um, influenced by everything that happens to it. They don't think of it as being... No, that's so wrong. Before the before a baby is born, know that this, this baby had a beginning long before it is your child. Like I write in the book, you know, a baby can have the mother's eyes, the father's dimples, and the brother's curly brown hair, but um, know that the child's soul is, is, it doesn't belong to you. It belongs to something greater that created it. Because, you know, the average way of looking at it is that it is just a biological being. Right. But we know, you know, from metaphysics, it's far more than that. Oh, it is. Uh -huh. oh, what, what made you decide to write this book? Well, basically, um, the, 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 my second pregnancy really propelled me into um, writing something. Now, what happens is, is that, you know, usually parents or soon-to-be parents They'll read everything that they can about um, the mechanics of bringing new life into this world. They'll read all of the pregnancy books, you know, what to expect and all of that. I found that something was missing. I said to myself, you know, nothing out there is really capturing the enormity of bringing new life into this world. Nothing is really grasping at that spiritual aspect of, you know, the whole coming of new life. And I searched and I searched for a book like I created. And there was really nothing out there. Of course, there are books on reincarnation. There are books on the indigo children. There are books about, um, you know, life between lives. Uh, but there was nothing about a whole, the, the baby coming into the world. And that's exactly what I wanted. So I basically took everything that I knew from the whole medical field, being a nurse, um, I took what I knew as being, as being a mother. I took what I knew as uh, being an intuitive. And I took what I knew as being a social or, or in the social work field. And I put that all together, and this is what I created. But basically, I saw a really a, a clear need for something like this, not only for parents, but for the healthcare field, for um, the educational field. Um, anybody who works with a child, I think, can really benefit from knowing these unique little nuances that really not everybody knows about a baby or young children. Yeah, they're not used to thinking of it that way. You that's know, right. they don't. You, that's why I think this book is going to reach a lot more people if they'll start thinking about it. That there is an eternal soul, eternal yes. spirit that does reincarnate time after time in many bodies, yes. and this is what's really happening with the the soul that's coming into the body that of the new baby that's being born. Right, and that that soul is present from the moment that they are born. As a matter of fact. Uh, a midwife, uh, I, uh, I gave a, a speaking, I had a speaking engagement two days ago, and I was speaking to a midwifery organization, and uh, I said to, I, we were talking about how the character of a baby is present from the moment that they open their eye, you know, the moment that they come out, and somebody said, no, that's evident even before they come out, it's evident in the belly, you know. Uh -huh. And it's so true, you know. Never look at a baby as a clean slate. Well, know? that's the way the the professionals usually exactly. do. Maybe we're going to be able to make them to look at it a little different. Oh, and the whole nature versus nurture. Uh, yeah, because you know, in my work with hypnosis, I've taken mm -hmm. many people through their birth experience, and they're very aware when they are in in the utero. They know everything that's going on, and they know when they enter the body. Uh, and you also believe too that the baby. Uh, picks the parents too before coming in. Oh yes, oh yes. So well, that's just part of, um, uh, you know, the, the spiritual lessons that all of us are here for. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know, it's my firm belief that uh, there's no, nothing random about uh, the parents that we choose. I mean, we choose a, a situation before birth. We choose a situation as a spirit um, that will best suit our needs in terms of growth. 
uh, spiritual growth and evolution and, uh, you know, just working on issues that uh, will perfect us, you know, for lack of a better saying. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what I find in my work because I work a lot with karma and people coming to me with family problems that usually we will pick someone that we have been with before and that uh, I found we do make a contract, we make a we, a deal with the people that we want to come back together with. That's right. Long before we enter the body, you know, saying this is what we're going to do. Usually they say, well, we didn't do such a good job last <laughs> time, did we? <laughs> let's come back and let's make a contract and try to do it okay. again. Well, that's another thing that a lot of people have difficulty understanding is when, say, a child um, dies. It's like, you know, right away, why would God allow, you know, such an innocent being to pass away? Why would a child be born only for God to take it away? And the, really, that's not what's going on. A child may have, may have knowledge of their passing even before they're born. In yeah. other words, that might be part of a pact that they had with another soul peer of theirs. Um, and I speak about this in the book. There's something that I call sacrificial um, development. And that's exactly what that is. Um, a soul can opt to sacrifice at themselves out of pure love for the development of another person. Let's say if it's the mother that needs to learn something here. Yeah. You know, the child, you know, could um, before their birth have a pact with this other person and say, "Look, as your child, I will, I will choose to sacrifice my being so that he can." help you grow in a way that that only that only doing that can do yes and see we're not aware of what the other lives were before this you know That's what right. went on with these different people that would make them decide to come back and have a pact like this that's right but i know i deal a lot with people who have lost children and i know it's very difficult but oh, that's nothing. all part of the lesson that yeah. we're supposed to be learning everything in life is a lesson and that doesn't make it any easier, but at mm -hmm. least we can look at it in a different way to know we're supposed to be learning from something from the situation. Otherwise, then I think that would be the uh, regrettable thing if this happened and the person didn't learn didn't anything grow. from it. That's exactly right. One of the things I write in the book is that the relationship you have, or the relationship you share with your children is by far one of the most powerfully powerfully defining um, relationships you can have. It ha can have the power to, uh, you know, uh, make your spirit grow in a way like no other relationship can. And I'm sure a lot of people who have children can testify to that. Yeah. Um, because of the great emotional bond that you share with your own child. And that's where, you know, I have a lot of uh, clients that have come to me with problems about these things. Mm -hmm. But many, many times when I have them under and we go back through these things, it always comes up that the child made an agreement mm -hmm. that it was only going to live even a few months, maybe even a few hours, yes. so that there would be something that the parent could learn from it. Yes. And yes. who knows, maybe they agree that later they will come back and be their child again. Oh, yes. Because we, we don't think of the soul as a baby it is a soul that has been around, the spirit has been around forever yeah. and gone through many, many lifetimes. That's right. And that's when I've told people, that child that you're grieving, maybe it might decide to come back. And another time, when you don't need a lesson like this, and it will be there for you. That is so true. That but it it, it's difficult for, for people to look at things in this way. Oh, especially when you're in the process of grieving, you know, oh, you, just, yeah. you know that whole you, you go through process of grieving. One of the processes is, is grief, and uh, besides grief, I mean, is anger. Oh yeah. And uh, and blame, and you look for anybody to blame, and that anger is there and very real and very strong. Um, so that's just part of the process. I think as as you go through that process and you come out through the end, I think that at that point that's when it's vital. What do you do with this now? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, one of my favorite quotes came from uh, the book, The Cultural Creative. And um, they quote a lady saying how when she lost her five-year-old son to cancer, uh, she says, it was as if there were a, uh, a white fire burning through my life 
and then leaving only what really matters, and that's only love. Mm-hmm. And really, it, that that was the gift I believe that her son gave her to really burn out what was frivolous and what was not important to, to for her to see what really, really is important in life. And now she's doing some type of charitable charitable work for Africa. And uh, I'm, you know, you think about it. Had her son not passed, would she be doing something like this that enriches so many? Yes, because they really changed their lives. Absolutely. If you look back at it, you can find that. You could see that. But it's so easy for people just to blame God. You know, why did God allow this and that to happen? But, you know, when we're into metaphysics, we know that God isn't the one that's doing it. Right. That we make these um, these pacts and these contracts on right. the other side, in the spirit side, before yes. we ever come in. Yes, I say that right in the beginning of the book, so that you get a clear reference as to you know, what I'm talking about when we talk about tragedies like this and the whole sacrificial development for some another soul. Mm-hmm. Um, I make that very clear in the beginning of the book that, uh, it, you know, it's, it's those decisions are not God's decisions. God gave us choice. And through that choice, we have the ability to have this, uh, this, this uh, motivation for growth. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but there are mm-hmm. so many people, when they're in the middle of this, they just, uh, they can't see it, and yeah. it, it can be very uh, difficult for them. Right. And I can see why they would be wanting to blame e- anybody because right. it doesn't make any sense. But more and more, I've heard a lot of stories of, of tragedy, um, it's, it's, you know, having to do with a child. And uh, I think after that, that process, that grieving process, that's um, when you'll see that they start to transform their lives and they'll, st- they'll be able to have that ability to look back and say, you know what, you know, maybe, maybe there was a reason for all of this. As, as difficult and as tragic as it was, maybe there was some reason because look what I'm doing now. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it takes a lot of soul searching. Absolutely. But maybe you know that's what I, part I, of the, what they're supposed to learn too. That's right. To look deeper into the reasons for things. But you know what I also hear as well is that, that they always seem to get signs of that their beloved passed, the, the one that uh, passed away. Like there was this story of this woman who um, lost her teenage daughter to uh, skin cancer. Yeah. And her daughter loved sunflowers, absolutely adored the big sunflowers. And um, her mother went after her, her daughter's death and her mother got into going into schools to talk about the dangers of uh, prolonged sun exposure, and uh, this is what she did, uh, to, you know, uh, because her daughter passed away from this, the... Uh, yeah, the, she uh, had first-hand infant. knowledge. And, uh, you know, what she what she saw one day go, going to a car after, after giving one of these talks at a school, she saw a beautiful, healthy sunflower laid right in front of her car. Uh-huh. So she said, you know, this is almost as if it's my daughter's, my daughter saying, you know, I'm proud of you, Mom, or that she's with me, even though, you know, not of, of you know, physical body, she's with me when I go to these places and with me always. Yeah, no, see, she took a tragedy and turned it around to be able to help other people. That's right. That's right. And I think, I think overall that is what we are all supposed to do. Everything, it should be a learning experience. And I know it's better, you know, it's a lot easier said than done. Yeah. I, you know, I realize that. But one of the most debilitating attitudes or behaviors we can do to ourselves is the feeling of helplessness and hopelessness. That basically just keeps us from living. And I'm sure if you think about it, if you were to be able to talk to the, per- to the one that you lost, be it a child or not, I'm sure that person would say, look, all I want you to do is move on. You need to move on. You need to keep on living for me, for everybody else who loves you. Yeah, because to grieve is just to be stagnant. Absolutely. There is no movement. There is no energy there at all then. Absolutely. And you move on through that anyway. That's right. I know there's a lot of people out there saying, well, it's easy for you to say. Right, right. I know that. Yeah. It's... uh, Maybe it's because we understand these things in a little different way. Yeah. Because, you know, I do counseling. I have thousands and thousands of people in my work as a, as a hypnotherapist, and many of them are carrying around so much of this. I call it the garbage and the baggage they carry around for years and years. 
Yes. And it's time to let it go, release it, and then move on. Absolutely. Like, but, you know, a lot of people don't even realize is that that, that actually um, affects your health. It does. That's it's, a lot of the health problems I have with people that come to see me. I mean, how many times are you hearing nowadays in the news that, oh, now they're finding a link between cardiac disease and uh, the inability to forgive? <laughs> or you'll see now they find a link between um, a woman's unhappiness in a marriage with, you know, dying from any other uh, disease. Uh, you know, you're finding more and more links between the mind, body, and soul. And yeah. it, we really need to establish a balance. And that's why, just getting back to my book, I the seeds of disease and the seeds of um, just the illness itself, they don't. They don't happen. They, they, those seeds are planted in childhood. It, you know, you just don't wake up with disease as an adult. You know, this is a lot, a long process, and a process that very well could have started in childhood, from imbalance, from um, the soul not getting what it needs, from you know, uh -huh. illusions of of life. And that's really what I talk about in the book as well, is that we need to start taking responsibility on how we are shaping what our children are perceiving in their world. Are they seeing it as unsafe? Are they, are they um, you know, seeing their parents' unforgiveness uh, for certain things? And really, I just take, put into illumination these issues. Because they're so vulnerable at that age that's and exactly people don't right. realize... Uh, how is this going to affect them the rest of their lives? Absolutely, and we need to nurture their authentic selves and help them to find their authentic selves. And think about how hard that is in today's world. Yeah. Today's world with, where, you know, uh, um, the media glorifies uh, pe celebrities, you know, celebrities that may not even be comfortable in their own skins, <laughs> let, alone <That's> have, true. <laughs> let alone being somebody who our children idolize. Uh -huh. And uh, I find that that's, that's something that we need to look at also. Are, you know, why are we idolizing, uh, you know, a star, um, what, on the basis that they make a lot of money? What, are we, what exactly are we, are they a good person? You know, I think, we, and children fall prey to this so often. Yeah. Um, so um, that's one of the things I talk about as well, that we as, as the adults, we need to, kind of refocus our children and say, you know, what's important in life that is nourishing the soul, finding their authentic selves. Don't, don't try to be somebody who you're not. And you also were talking about in the book, too, that uh, many children in the same family are all different. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm sure anybody with more than one child could say that. Yeah, I've got a big family, and I, you have three, don't yes. you? Yes, yes. So I we know. know they're all different. They're individuals. They are. They so are. My two boys couldn't be more opposite than, I mean, one loves sports, the other hates it. One is sensitive, the other is a brute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the way mine were. The, my girls were all different from each other, and they still are. But that's where you have to realize they were each individual souls that chose to come in and to be together. That's exactly Maybe right. Maybe they had past lives with their siblings also. Oh, that's exactly right. And then what I write about also in the book is um, there is a phenomenon with uh, conjoined twins. Oh, yes. And there's, there's a conjoined twin that um, they share the frontal lobe of the brain. Now, anybody who knows neurology, the frontal lobe of the brain is the brain that houses personality and individuality. So logically or scientifically, if they share the same frontal lobe of the brain, wouldn't it be that they ha they share one personality? No, but they don't. They have two very distinct personalities. Mm -hmm. So it just goes to show, well, then there are two separate souls in that. Absolutely. You, but know? you know, one thing that I found mm -hmm. that I think is a good explanation of that is, you know, I always tell people uh, when we're doing the therapy and doing the past lives, Vows are very powerful. The promises and things we make, you know, on the other side before the per the person is going through the death experience and coming back, those those promises are very powerful. Yeah. And like with the conjoined twins, they might say we'll we'll never be separated again. Mm. And that's very literal. Mm, <laughs> and that's I know very they don't mean it that literal. Yeah. Oh, I never heard of that. That's interesting. 
That's what I found. And then, you know, if you've noticed when they try to separate them, yes. many times one or the other will die. Yes. Because yes. they they have to be together. Yes. Yes. And uh, there are twi- uh, conjoined twins that um, they move their body so instinctively to be in sync that, you know, they couldn't possibly, they, 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 the, the idea of separating them, they really don't want to do it. They said, well, you know, this is the way we've lived for so long, and these are even children. Yeah. Children have said, we don't have no interest in being separated, you know, of course, children who are able to talk already, because they have developed such a unified way of living that they couldn't even envision not having the sibling next to them or, you know, joined to them. It's but, just, you know, in mm-hmm. some of them, though, are joined in such a way that it's impossible for them to live. Yeah. That so is those true. Are, they are separating them, but I know the doctors aren't thinking of the individual souls in those bodies. Right. And the reasons why this could have happened in the first place. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, they wouldn't be thinking of that. Oh, they're not thinking about it. <laughs> but see, what I had a guest on here a few weeks ago who's mm-hmm. going to be a speaker at the conference who is a, was a doctor for 44 years. Oh, that should be And he believes, like we do, you know, that we create disease ourselves for various reasons. No, well, that's a rarity. <laughs> you know, it's, it's all. He, he believes the same thing, and he tried very hard to uh, use this this way of understanding in his practice, but of mm-hmm. course the other doctors didn't understand and the hospitals didn't understand, so mm-hmm. he had a difficult way. Yes. But um, I know you working in obstetrics too, you had a hard time with a lot of the doctors sometimes. I did, too, I you? did, absolutely, with protocols, with seeing, you know, uh, one of the things that um, would get to me is that, um, you know, this whole thing of controlled birth. And, um, you know... Yes, I, I like the way you bring that out. Oh, yeah. That is not right for the doctors to do it at their own convenience. Or oh, the absolutely. Patient, and it's done or the so... the patient's convenience. Go ahead and talk about that. Oh, it's, it's done so often these days. And what's really troublesome is that now we're luring more and more women um, into the illusion that con- you can control birth. And what ha- they ha- what what studies have shown over and over again is that once you st- you try to control birth, the more you try to control the process of birth, the more out of control you become. In other words, let's say you tr- you try to induce um, labor. Chances are the the induction will fail. Chances are you'll need more medical intervention. You will need things like an epidural for the pain because they, they're putting a Pitocin drip in there, which, which creates stronger contractions, thus more pain for the woman. Uh, you're gonna have a med- you may have medical intervention of using forceps, of using vacuum extraction, of, um, and then inevitably you are 250% more likely to have a cesarean section. When they try to induce you, like you know, with putting um, like an induction type of chemical in you, many um, times the baby isn't even in position; it hasn't even dropped enough. That's right. That's right. That is absolutely correct. And um, you know, it's it, the, the the studies have shown this over and over again. Yet doctors and now more and more women are under this illusion that you know the body is biomechanical why not totally predictable totally manipulatable we can do it we can you know we can a baby can be born at our command or their convenience and their convenience right and it's just so not not the, the you know the truth because I remember you said in the book, like, uh, you know, someone has to go to a wedding. Oh, yes. There's things they, they want to have their body. They want to have it over before things that they have planned, you know. Oh, yes. I've, had, I've, I've heard of a patient. Um, she told me, well, the reason why I had my, my labor inducted, and, uh, induced, I'm sorry, induced was because um, my sister's wedding is going to be in two weeks, and I wanted to be able to fit into the bridesmaid dress. <laughs> Uh, and I just, uh, you know, I'm like, whoa. <laughs> and the doctor did it. Absolutely. was in, in complete agreement. No problem. No they aren't even thinking about the danger to the baby. Not even thinking. Not even thinking. Not only to the baby, but to the mother herself. Yes. Again, you know, cesarean sections, there's major abdominal surgery. You know, although it is 
absolutely. And trust me, I am not saying anything negative about cesarean sections because God knows it it saves you know mothers and babies lives. Sometimes it is necessary. Absolutely, absolutely. But when it's when you think that you know when you think about it and that it's done is a purely elective thing, it's it, it makes me wonder: Do the women know, or the the women, the families, do they know of the possible consequences that can come of it? Greater risk of infection, greater risk of complications, less um, less of a chance to bond with your baby because of the pain afterwards. You know, all of these things. I wonder if their physicians are telling them. Are they educated? Do they know of these consequences? Because you're hearing so much of it. So yeah, you much. said they were increasing a lot. Oh, yes. Yes, and it's all this illusion of, you know, hey, no problem. We can, you know, 38 weeks. That's really the, you know, the, they consider a full-term baby 30 weeks and up, 38 weeks and up. Well, yeah. we hit the 38 week. Let's do it. <laughs> the baby may have other plans. Oh, yes, <laughs> and often the baby does. And the baby's just not ready to be born. And it's so evident in all of those things going wrong. You know, vacuum extraction is used when the baby can't fall into the birth canal. And so what the doctor has to do or the practitioner has to do is basically apply a vacuum to the top of the head and literally pull it out. Uh-huh. So you think about that. Or forceps, same thing. They grab a, 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 this tool that grabs the, the child's head and wraps wraps around the child's head, and again, they pull the baby out of the birth canal. So tell me, if that's not an indication that the baby's not ready to be born, I don't know what is. <laughs> <laughs> if you let it go the way it's supposed to, it's so much easier. Yeah. If I had one of mine without a doctor even, it just she just decided she was going to come <laughs> like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's so true. But... Um, you know, it's, it's, but, it's, you know, too, you also said it does, sometimes the doctor does it because of his convenience. Oh, absolutely. Oh, that you happens. Know, you know, so I often. know on this show they said I could say anything I want, and <laughs> I do talk about the different professions. And I just, you know, I just want people to know that they aren't gods anyway. <laughs> no, and so many, I hate to say this, too, because I'm, <laughs> I'm in the healthcare field, but so many think that they are God, and they, they perform as though they are, and they... You know, it's a, it's an unusual physician that will admit that, you know, that there is a, a, something much, much greater uh, that commands, you know, um, things that they'd have no control of. Um, uh -huh. But, yes, absolutely, they're, they do this, they do the uh, birth for their convenience. Um, that they'll say, you know, hey, I'm, go I'm going to be on call this weekend, why don't we schedule it? Or they try to make it sound um, appealing to the woman by saying, you know, well, since, you know, you can, ha you can have your husband uh, take a certain day off and you can have the kids set up with child care and um, then we can, do, we can do the induction, you know, the, the induction. Yeah. Mm hmm And that's how they, they make it sound so alluring. <laughs> Maybe if nothing else, we'll make some of the pregnant women question some of these things. Yeah, I hope so. Well, I write a lot of uh, par in a lot of parenting journals, and I write a lot about um, you know the whole phenomenon of con controlled births and inductions and stuff like that. And uh, I'm just basically putting out the facts. I mean, there's, it's just re representing all of the statistics and making women n know for sure what's going on with their bodies and what are the possible consequences. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, th you know, education I believe is a powerful tool, and uh, as long as they know what they're getting themselves into, yeah, yeah, they could just say, no, I think I just wait until exactly. nature takes its course. Exactly, you know? exactly. Because one of mine, I kept having false alarms, and I kept going in, and my husband asked the doctor one time, well, you know, when do you think it'll come? <laughs> and he said, the doctors themselves don't know what causes the labor to begin. That's right. And, you know, if you just let it happen, it's all natural and, and right. certain triggers happen, and especially the baby itself has its own trigger whenever it's ready to come. That's right. The, the only thing that they know for sure is that the baby initiates its birth. Uh-huh. The baby is the one that starts the hormones and everything starting, you know, to, to bring about its own labor and birth. Uh -huh. It's really not the mom. <laughs> 
And, you know, they always talk about, well, you're overdue, you know, you're going too long. Maybe they just miscalculated in the first place. Nobody right. knows. Definitely. Well, if you think about this statistic, there's seven out of ten pregnancies come three to ten days after their due date. Uh-huh. So think about that. That's a, that's a huge percentage that come after the due date, well after, as many as ten days after. And many, many, the, uh, many, many practitioners don't go beyond the week. So the, the, beyond the the the, the uh, 41st week, they're already thinking we have to induce. Yeah, they keep saying it's going to get too big. It's going to yeah. be hard. Oh, that's habit. another thing. I mean, you have I've had I've had practitioners go straight to the to the delivery room, or rather to the operating room, to perform a cesarean for a suspected big baby, and out pops a six pounder. I mean, uh-huh. it's it's I've I've seen it all the time. And they think it's going to be too and big, and that's what they big. want to do it. Yeah, yeah, uh-huh. yeah. So they wind up with a little bit of egg on their face. <laughs> <laughs> well, but I think maybe it it will help the mothers to question this anyway and think yeah. about it. Just let nature take its course. You know, there's a joke too. You know, they will come in the middle of the night a lot of times because wasn't that when they were conceived? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you also talk about the ability to communicate with your unborn baby, and yeah. I truly, truly believe in that capacity. And, um, you know, you can basically talk to your baby and say, you know, it'll be a good time during this time to, to come. Not that the baby will listen, but, I mean, you know, it, it, there, is so, there is such that possibility to communicate with the baby. The baby's hearing you. The baby feels... You know the the, the uh, loving vibration of uh, or, or your intention. Uh huh. The baby senses that. Because in my work, you know, when I've done the hypnosis and they mm-hmm. are in the womb, they know everything that's going on. That's what I'm talking about. So if you, if the mother talks to the baby or the father, you know, say lovingly, say uh, intending for the baby to come at a safe time, maybe you know, in such and yeah. such a time when. You know, not when I'm stuck in traffic and, and it'll take me two hours to get to the hospital, but, you know, there's definitely a way to communicate with your baby. And uh-huh. uh, I think so many of us don't take that time to just sit and attune to the child. There's also a thing called, a flower essence called forget-me-not. Um, do you know what flower essences are? Yes. Uh-huh. Well, I do, but I don't know if the listeners yeah, flower, do. Flower essences are... Basically, um, a tincture of the, the the imprint of a flower captured in an alcohol, alcohol base, and uh, they were originally developed by um, a physician called um, Edward Bach, I believe. Are, are they oils, or are they just an essence? Uh, the essence is based in an alcohol uh, in an alcohol solution, uh-huh. um, and it's 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 a method where they take they take the flower. And uh, they capture its, its I don't know, the, the essence of it. Um, and it's this whole process that they do this. Yeah. And um, they capture it in a little bottle in the alcohol base. And the way you use it is you can place it in water um, and drink it. Uh, and it's only a few drops that you would use. Or you can place it under your tongue, about two drops four times a day. Or you can, for pregnant women, this is what I advise to um, my clients, is to place 20 drops in their bath water, and um, what they do is they stir it uh, with a figure eight um, motion, the bath water, and that's basically to awaken its properties. And then you sit in the bath in, in that bath water for about 20 minutes, uh-huh. and um, you know when you're ready to get out, you just pat yourself dry and take about 10 minutes to attune to your baby. And um, the essence of forget me not is supposed to greatly enhance that ability. To communicate? Yes. That's what you you were you, you advise using it for then. Absolutely, and I write that in the book. Yeah, to to communicate to it also makes you more aware of those timeless soul bonds that you have with your child. Mm-hmm. So we talked earlier about all of those packs and those vows and everything. You know, maybe you can suddenly have a, an awakening to those packs. Uh, out, because sometimes this. you also talked about dreams too. Oh, absolutely! Dreams well, is a well, very powerful pregnant, thing. You know, they can have some very uh, prophetic dreams. Oh yes, 
Oh, yes. I've heard many women, including myself, <laughs> having very, very vivid dreams with your soon-to-be child. Um, and, you know, they're very powerful dreams. What I always advise people is to, and I'm sure other people have heard this many times, is to keep a pen and pad next to your bed to capture the dream as soon as you open your eyes. Because if you wait when you, until after you take a shower or whatever, you, you're not going to remember the dream. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, so as soon as you open up your eyes, capture the dream on paper. And, um, you know, you'd be surprised how, you know, after a year after, not even maybe six months after, you'll take a look at your dream and say, wow, you know, maybe this was um, a communication with my child or, you know, maybe this was a little glimpse into who he was or she was before. You know, it's, it's, it could be a very profound experience. Did You also said, too, that you... You know, they communicate with the child before they're born and then right afterwards, too. Yeah. Because you can be very close to the child that way. Absolutely. Um, the way I talk about uh, bonding is um, a technique I've called intuitive nurturing. Uh-huh. And intuitive nurturing is basically um, a, a profound way or a deep way to connect with your baby in such a way that you can respond to your baby without having your baby necessarily express their need to you. Um, And this has been shown to happen with people who physically have contact with their babies very frequent during the day, and that can happen through uh, wearing the child in a sling, um, sleeping with the child. You know, there's been a lot of controversy about co-bedding. I don't know if you've heard about that or co-sleeping. Um, you know, there are definite, definitely safe ways to sleep with your baby. Um, and that's something that I outline in the book as well, how to safely have your baby within arm's reach. Um, and all of these way, oh, and also kangaroo care. And what kangaroo care is a method of putting your baby on your chest with her ear to your heart. Uh-huh. Um, and all of these techniques, greatly enhance your intu- intuitive bond with your baby and it strengthens her, their immune system it regulates their sleep it regulates their um, cardiac or their heart um, rhythms and rate it regulates their breathing it regulates their temperature they've even shown how when the baby is laying on the baby's uh, on, when the baby is laying on the mother's chest how the mother temperature will change if somebody simply says your baby is cold the ba- the mother will automatically without the, you know obviously regulating temperature is not a a voluntary thing and the mother's the mother will her her temperature would automatically raise just to that one command <laughs> that that shows how they are still connected even absolutely. after their, you know, the birth so they're not really separated absolutely yet. i've heard of women who who um, practice intuitive nurturing, who know when their baby is sick before they have signs and symptoms of it. Yeah, I used to feel that. Yeah, yeah, and that think think about how powerful that is. Uh huh. You know, that's a very powerful thing to be able to attune to your baby so well that the baby doesn't have to cry, doesn't have to show any form of distress uh, or pain, um, and to be able to respond to that. Uh, it, that's a very powerful thing, and I think that we live in a society that really advocates too much separation. You know, we have the whole sleep training stuff, you know, where, uh, which is, I believe, very counterintuitive, where they tell you to, you know, ignore your baby's cries. Yeah. Uh, you had, uh, just a little while ago, you had that um, um, feeding on, on uh, schedule. Well, feeding on schedule, think about that. You know, <laughs> I never were pet on schedule. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So I, yeah, that was, that, was a, that was a very clear, um, uh, like, instruction for new parents, I remember oh, that. Yeah. That, was a, that was about 10, 10, 10 15 years ago. Yeah, um, because I know when, when I was having mine, they were discouraging breastfeeding. You had to have the bottle and you had to have it uh, on schedule. But I went with the breastfeeding, and now look, it's just a 180 degree turn, and now breastfeeding is all of the rage now. And oh, not the bottle. and so it should be too. You need think about it: 200 chemicals in breast milk that cannot be duplicated in artificial milk. 
Well, I was always told, too, that anything we have had, any childhood diseases or anything that we are immune to, we pass that immunity on to the baby, and it it keeps that immunity for as long as two years. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, that is absolutely true, and then some. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, there there is really just nothing that compares to human milk. Um, And, you know, and if if you just do it naturally, you don't look at the clock and say, well, is it time or not? Right. And it's also something where where is born it's born of intuitive nurturing as well. You the baby doesn't have to cry of hunger. You start to get the sense. Oh, you, you know the, the she's. I believe that my baby is is hungry now, and yeah. you just bring the baby to the breast, and you know the baby is inevitably hungry. It doesn't have to cry. Doesn't have to show that it, it's hungry. It's uh it's a, it's a very freeing thing. You also said in the book, too, that children that are ignored and left to cry alone, after a while they begin to shut down, yes. and this can affect their emotional development. Absolutely, absolutely. It's called uh, Dr. William Sears, who is an author of many wonderful, wonderful baby books, um, he calls that shutdown syndrome. And what that is is that um, it's basically another word for failure to thrive, and failure uh-huh. to thrive means that the baby... Uh, no longer develops normally as it should. The growing is, is stunted, um, development is stunted overall. And that has been proven to uh, occur in uh, children who are left like crying in their cribs, who are, whose cries are ignored, or they go through this, uh, they think that going through this uh, sleep training is the right way to do it. Yeah. Um, and uh, inevitably what happens uh, is that the baby cries and cries and cries when they realize that there is nobody coming to their aid or to comfort them they realize that hey I've got too much energy leaving me let me just shut down so this way whatever little energy I have I conserve mm-hmm. and that's what shutdown syndrome is you know, they always said, well, you'll spoil the baby if you keep picking it up. Oh, isn't that hideous? I think about that now. It just makes my stomach turn. Yeah, because, you know, that's what they always said. You know, you shouldn't hold it that much. You shouldn't pick it up every time it whimpers. But I think if you really become in tune with it, you know the difference. You know when if you would be overdoing it. Yeah. Well, there is no overdoing when it comes to physical contact. Again, all uh, all of the evidence suggests that close contact with a baby or with a young child enhances their immune system and regulates their inner workings. It's, it's, it soothes their mind, body, and soul and enhances uh, their development. Mm-hmm. So it does everything opposite than what they say, you know, oh, put that distance or don't pick them up or whatever. I mean, it's, it's just a wonderful, wonderful thing by keeping close contact. And plus you get that added benefit of, getting that intuitive sense of what they're going through yeah. and responding to them in an intuitive way. On the news here just the other night, I was thinking, where have these people been all these years? They were talking about the neonatal units with the little preemies and that how they discovered, I don't know out of the blue or what, that if they would, the nurses, the nurses' aid would sit and hold them and rock them, yes. that they would thrive. And uh, they called it tender, loving care. And they said they need that touch. And I was thinking, duh, you know, where exactly. have you been? This is, people have known this for a long time. Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, it was it was the Colombian physicians in Bogota that uh really coined the whole term kangaroo care and they did this uh, study with premature babies and what they found was they were able to cut premature mortality rates from 70 percent all the way to 30 percent that that much of a decrease in mortality rates just from practicing the kangaroo care that i explained putting the the baby in, on the mother's chest uh-huh. from 70 percent to 30 percent that's pretty dramatic Yes, but I was watching that news show and I was thinking, you're just now discovering this? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Isn't that something? And they did this back in, uh, I think it was in the early 1980s, they, they did this discovery. Yeah, because um, they found out the ones that were left in the little you know, cribs and in the incubators, mm-hmm. uh, they didn't have any touch at all because I guess they thought they were too small. But yeah. there was a failure to thrive. Yes, uh-huh. yes, yes. 
So what they found is by taking out the baby and just, you know, even though, okay, there's a risk of, of infection and all of that, they figured, well, you know, keeping them in an isolate will keep them protected from any pathogens or, you know, uh, foreign germs. bodies. Yeah, germs and all of that. Exactly, you know? but it, when in reality they absolutely needed that touch, that human contact, especially with somebody who has such a profound love for them like their mother, and they sense that too. Mm. Oh, absolutely. I'm watching the clock. You know, that's what my doctor said the other night. Wow, the hour sure goes by fast. <laughs> it sure did. Wow. I'm looking. Because <laughs> I have to stop at five kills because okay. um, for, for, they're going to put commercials in at a later date. But uh, is there anything that you think is the most important thing you would like to tell parents out there? Well, basically. To be it, parents. I'm sorry? Uh-huh. What was that? I'm sorry, what was your question? Or to be parents, you know, anything that you would really like to tell them? Well, basically, my, my whole thing is, is by all means, um, obey your natural instinct to embrace your child. Um, let's, let's, let us stop treating our children in a way that has been so counterintuitive all these years. Let's you know, stop with all of this rushed and hurried pace and let's look at our children's soul for what they are. Let's not, um, you know, try to put them in things that we would have liked ourselves to, to have done. We all, <laughs> I know a lot of parents, you know, me included, um, uh -huh. that has, you know, done something like that. You know, you inspire them to do something that you yourself wanted to do when you were younger. No, let's look at our child for the strengths and weaknesses that they have. You know, every child is here for a reason. And once they find their authentic selves, that is an accomplishment that, you know, nobody, you know, there's nothing, there's no amount of money that can buy that. There's no amount of other type of outward happiness that, you know, they can achieve without finding their authentic selves. And um, basically, basically that's it. <laughs> I think this is uh, maybe it's going to give a lot of parents an alternative way to look at this mm -hmm. from the traditional, right? And Christine yeah. Ramos has been the guest tonight, and her book is called A, Jur a Journey into Being. And it will be available in another week or so. It takes a little bit to get it to the distributors, to get it to the bookstores, but it's called A Journey into Being, and it's all about... Seeing your babies as spirit and nurturing that and learning to look at it in a different way. And Christine is going to be a speaker at our conference that we're going to have on June the 3rd and 4th, the Transformation Conference, and it's going to be in Fayetteville, Arkansas, at the Clarion Inn. She will be another one of our wonderful speakers, and you'll be able to hear much more from her, and you'll be able to have contact with her also uh, during the breaks to ask questions. So we're hoping that a lot of you will want to come and enjoy all of this. Right, but now we're coming down to the time to close. Thanks, Christine, for being on tonight. Thank you, Dolores. It was my pleasure. Is there any way anyone can contact you if they need to? Absolutely. You can go on my website, and that is www.intuitivenurturing.com. Intuitivenurturing.com. Yes, and my email is within that, um, within that e uh, website, but I'll give it to you as well. And it's simply christine at intuitivenurturing.com. Okay. And anyone that wants any information about the books that Ozark Mountain Publishing is putting out, or information about the Transformation Conference can go on our website. Our website is www.ozarkmountain, but it's abbreviated, ozarkmt.com, ozarkmt.com, or you can call us at 1-800-935-0045. 1-800-935-0045. If you enjoyed the show, check out more of our other videos and be sure to subscribe and click the like button. Thank you for listening to the Metaphysical Hour with Dolores Cannon.